The scripture passage that we hope to consider at this time is Revelation 20, beginning at the seventh verse and going through the end of that chapter. <clears throat> Revelation 20. This is about Judgment Day. Uh, we're no longer here at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem that it's been completed and now we have the thousand year reign and that thousand year reign we've spent two weeks on having to do with the coming to faith of saints it's called they they came to life where that is uh, Mentioned, uh, I can't find it right now. They came to life in verse uh, 4. Well, your and my coming to life is when we receive faith. Uh, In Nicodemus, Jesus said it's being born again. All God's people come to life and we reign with Christ, which simply means we are in the kingdom of God, we are in the kingdom of Christ, we bless, adore, love God's kingdom, we work in that kingdom. And uh, Jesus, you know, sends those who are born to life. He says, I send you to all the world to go preach the gospel. And so we are reigning with Christ now. The Holy Spirit's poured out on the church. The work of evangelism went out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria into the other most parts of the earth. And that reign continued. It's not an exact thousand years. Uh, When Christ ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of God. He has all authority in heaven on earth. And that authority is given to the church. And so that's about 2,000 years ago. And so that thousand reign, a thousand year reign with Christ means many, many years. Verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne in him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Just keep your Bible open. It is this passage in Revelation that has really had a lot of prophetic analysis. There's a whole subject called eschatology. Eschatology, the study of the last thing. And so, this passage, by various studies, various writers, various authors, 
over the years has been interpreted many ways. We're going to look at this using Scripture to define what we're saying here because when the thousand years are over, That means when it is time for this creation's purpose to be finished. Understand, the purpose of this creation is the calling together of the church. When the saints under the altar are praying in the first chapters of Revelation, They pray to God, how long, O Lord? And God's answer is, until the last of those who are elect, who are part of the church, are living and brought in. And then you can debate this until the cows come home. Does that mean they have to be born? (laughs) Or does that mean they're just conceived? Because we firmly believe from Scripture that life begins at consumption. But when the last of the chosen, that number that God knows, every soul that God has chosen, when they have been conceived, is what I'm going to say, born, living, the end comes then this creation has no purpose. God's people will reign with Christ till the end of the world. You understand that? Christ is king. There will always be a church. There will always be those who follow Christ. The church will have its ups and downs in different places. But the church will continue and all of the sheep that God has given Jesus Christ will come into the kingdom. Other sheep I have not of this fold, Jesus says. They're not from the Jewish community. They are the Gentiles. Them also I will bring. When that thousand years are over, And I don't know when. If you listen to family radio, it'll happen in less than a year. It's May, what is it, 25 of 2011. Have you you heard that message? It goes on the radio frequently. But uh, they have figured it out. And and, uh, I have a book about this thick, about an inch thick, of all the prophecies of the end of the world. (laughs) Want to read it? I mean, they were forecasting of the world soon after Christ ascended to heaven. And, uh, you know, these people, I don't know, way back in the, in the 80s, uh, I, I got a phone call one day and, and they said, Oh, Al, you're still here. And I said, Yeah. Oh, good. Because uh, she said to me, I'm still here too. And that was supposed to be the day the world ended. And so... If I really knew, I think I'd be tempted to buy, you know, a Lamborghini on time payments and uh, (laughs) enjoy it for a month. (laughs) Just a joke. (laughs) Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour. Although the, the, uh, the, the message I was referring to earlier, they said, that doesn't mean we don't know the year. (laughs) Well, I plan to come and visit you sometime after, you know, I'm in Korea. And I think you'll still be here after May 25, 2011. But if not, we'll all meet together at at heaven. So it's not not a big issue. But here Satan will be released and go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog together in for battle. So, boys and girls, I just love that you're here for this Revelation study. If you read that passage carefully, you could tell your mom and your dad something. You tell them, what is Satan's purpose 
in being released. Remember, he is bound for this thousand years. Because he is not allowed to deceive the nations. But now, John is told by God, when it comes to the end, then Satan is going to be released. Because God has a purpose in Satan, and his purpose is really to complete the work of Romans chapter 9. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on him on whom I will have compassion. Remember, people of God, I I should have called the sermon this. Judgment is redemptive. For God's people. But boys and girls, the Bible never says everybody is going to be saved at the end of the world. It does say Christ, authority, and dominion will be in all the nations. But there are people living in every generation who are not the chosen people. He's preaching the gospel. There are some whom God, by His wisdom, by His pleasure, does not grip By His Holy Spirit. Those are the ones whom the devil is going to deceive and gather to gather to fight against God. Now, you see the words there, Gog and Magog. Does anybody know where that passage comes from? If you go back to Ezekiel, okay, go to the book of Ezekiel and uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 38. Do you have time for that or you got that roast in the oven? Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. Very interesting. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Gog. That's Ezekiel. Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords, Persia, Cush, another name for Egypt, and put will be with them, all with shields and helmets, also Gomer with all its troops, and Beth Togomah, from the far north with all its troops, the many nations with you. God is saying, bring on the battle. I'm bringing you. I've got a hook in your nose. I'm pulling you, just like you pull a fish out of the water. That fish has no choice. God is doing it. It it reminds me sometimes of when uh, that great story of Elisha when the Arameans have surrounded Elisha and his servant. And then Elijah prays to God and says, God, let, let him see. And then God opens his eyes and he sees all surrounding them, the angels and the horses and chariots of fire. Well, God here is bringing in all these nations... This is at the time of Ezekiel. And God says, I'm bringing you to me and I'm going to defeat you. Look at Ezekiel 39, 1 to 6. Son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, 
This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I'm against you, O Gog, chief priest of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and drag you along. I will bring you from the far north and send you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops, the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the Lord. I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in safety in the coastlands, and they will know that I am the Lord. This is fulfilled at the time of the Maccabees. I don't know how well you know the history between the Old and the New Testaments, but you've probably heard of Judas Maccabeus when the nations were going to destroy Israel, Syria. And God raised up uh, Judas Maccabeus and others, and they completely defeated them. It's also sometimes considered that Ezekiel was fulfilled in the, in the time of Esther where you have Mordecai and so on and that whole tromping of those who were going to destroy the Jews. So the word Gog and Magog to any person living at the time of Revelation, they knew that right away. Gog and Magog is not a place of defeat for the church. Gog and Magog is the place where God brought the nations against Israel and God destroyed those nations. Is that clear to you? Make sense to you? And so what's going to happen at the end of the world is that there is going to be this final victory of God over the, the heathen nations. No. If you are my age, you will remember hearing that Gog and Magog had a lot to do with Russia. How many of you remember that? Okay. Well, it's very interesting because I, I wanted to get into some details on that. And uh, <clears throat> here's how they came to that conclusion. They didn't let biblical facts get in the way. That's one thing. But uh, they're, they're just saying, you know, well, we're, we're literally taking Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39, and we're taking it for what it says. And, and so they said, well, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and the word chief is in Hebrew, rush. And so since chief is rush in Hebrew, well, that stands for Russia. See? It's plain as day, right? And then you have this whole thing. Gog starts with G. Soviet Georgia starts with G. And so they put those two together. Gomer starts with G. Germany starts with G. And so you put those two together and, and you, you can see how that works. Well, the one commentator I read, he also said, guesswork starts with G <laughs> as well. <laughs> so there are always those who raise up current things and say, well, this is the battle of Gog and Magog. Uh, last week, uh, or two weeks ago now, the flotilla, you, if you're keeping up on world news, you remember the the Israelis boarded this uh, ship from Turkey and, and uh, you know, got on there. Well, right away, the rabbinical council in Jerusalem is, is saying, well, this is Gog and this is Magog happening. This is the beginning of this battle of Gog and Magog. Now, I'm going to be right out with you. I do know God has a tremendous... Uh, protection of Israel over the years. It's always amazed me that that war, was it in 1970? Ooh, let me see. I know where I was living. It was the early 70s, I think. Remember when that three-day war, Israel went in, went right into Egypt? Do you remember that? Went all the way down. 
And that was just amazing. This little country. Well, now, as you know, you have all kinds of nations against Israel. Even our own nation appears to me right now, those in in positions of power are, are opposed to Israel. And so, I'm not going to say this is Gog and Magog. I'm not going to do that. Because Gog and Magog has to do with the church who are protected by God. We are the new Israel. And so, what you have here, the devil is going to deceive people, tremendous numbers of them, according to verse 8. They marched across the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. Now, There are many places in the world where the church is being more and more squeezed, right? Today. Now, what you have to understand here, who's bringing this army and surrounding the church? Who's doing that? God is. Now, you're going to ask yourself, why? God is doing it, people of God, like he did it with Elisha and Elisha's servant. Israel saw her protection. Israel saw the strength of God. And God is doing the same thing here in this part of Revelation. The church is not going to be destroyed. The church is is going to be protected. And this is God's way of showing you and me that we are in the kingdom of God and Christ has all authority. Let those rattle their swords all they want to. The church will not be removed from the earth. Because it says here, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Where did that ever happen? You know your biblical history? You know by a, a man by the name of Elijah? And there was going to be this attack on Elijah because they were going to, to destroy him because of the famine and all this stuff. And when the troops came out, 50 men came out to get Elisha, Elisha called down fire from heaven and destroyed them. So, the king sends out another 50 and fire destroys them as well. You have the same thing happening in Chronicles chapter 7. By the way, that was in 2 Kings 1. In uh, 2 Chronicles 7, Solomon is dedicating the temple. And they have, you know, thousands of animals on this altar. How did that fire start? Well, God sent fire down from heaven. So, the question is, and I don't have an answer for you, is this going to be real fire from heaven? I I don't know. I just know one thing, that those who are going to try to destroy the church and the devil in the last days is not going to be successful. Fire destroyed them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, that's hell, where the beast and false prophet had been thrown, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is the end of Satan's power. Now, on judgment day, the dead are judged. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. That's Jesus. And I... Always think of uh, Matthew, is that 25, where you have Jesus and the sheep and the goats passage? That's Matthew 25 or 24, right in that ballpark. And so Jesus is the judge. You've got the sheep on the left and you have the, 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 the goats on the left, the sheep on the right. So Jesus is the judge. He's seating on it. 
earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. That's a very interesting thing because in Psalm 114, it says this, When Israel came out of Egypt, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. Remember what happened to the Red Sea? It parted for God to go through. What happened to the Jordan River? It flees in front of Israel. The mountains skipped like lambs and the hills like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool and the hard rock into springs of water. The creation will tremble at the judgment of God. It will not stand in the way of God's judgment any more than the uh, Red Sea did or the Jordan River. Now, verse 12. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and their books were opened. Now, go back to verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. It's very significant. The word dead in verse 12 does not refer to to those who came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. These dead are the dead who come to life after a thousand years, but they don't come to life because they have been converted and been gripped by the Holy Spirit. These are the dead who have always lived against God, Opposed to God, without God. And now they stand before the throne and books were opened. Books have to refer to their life. Boys and girls, does God know everything about your life? Is that true? Everything you've ever done? Everything you've ever said? Everything you ever thought? It's true. Every one of us has a book. Now, which Books are opened. It's the book or the books of the dead. Those who have lived their whole life not under a covenant God but outside of a covenant God. These are the unbelievers. And so the books are opened. Everything they've ever done. We read about David's sins in, in, in the Scripture. In a sense, the book is open there. But he is written in the book of life. There's another book was opened, which is the book of life. Some Bibles capitalize book of life. I think it should be. Now, the book of life, boys and girls, is the list the record of all those who belong to the church. If you're in school, your, your teacher has a list of all the students in her class or his class. And so you're there and you're there and you're there and you're there. But there are a whole bunch of other people that are not in that group. The book of life is made up of all of those whom God chose before the foundations of the world whom he called, whom he justified, whom he glorified. It's the church. I assume, 
because you haven't proven otherwise, your name is written in this book of life. So now, there are a whole bunch of books open that you could read all the deeds and the actions of these dead people who are not godly, and you have the book of life. Now, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. We Calvinists okay with that? Because you and I have always been taught we are saved by faith, not by work. So here you see Jesus is judging the people by their work. Why can't he judge these by faith? They're not people of faith. These are the unbelievers. Their judgment comes, well, by their work. If you believe you are such a good boy and such a good girl, you can get into heaven because everything you did was right and good and perfect. You're never going to make. There's the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus knew what he was thinking. He says, well, obey the commandments. Well, which ones, he said. And Jesus rattles them off. Well, he says, I- I've done that all. Anything else? I sell everything. Give your money to the poor. And all we know is that he went away sorrow. And then the disciples asked Jesus, Why? And Jesus says, It's easier for a camel. The biggest animal an Israelite knew was a camel. They didn't know about elephants. You get a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's that dinky little thing mom will, you know, sew with once in a while. You get a camel to go through there. It's easier than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Wow, who can be saved? They ask. With God, all things are possible. These people are the dead who have rejected God, turned their back against Him, do not love Him, have not been gripped by grace. They are judged by their work and they're damned. Same way with those goats. You didn't feed me. You didn't give me a drink. You didn't visit me. You didn't comfort me. You didn't take me in. You lived a whole life. Excluding me. The sea gave up the dead. Well, a whole bunch of people, boys and girls, died in the flood. They come and stand before God. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Hades is the place where the souls of the unbelievers stay until the resurrection when they will go to hell, body and soul. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. That simply means this, boys and girls, everywhere there's a dead unbeliever, God raised him up and got him standing before Christ. And they're all judged the way they want to be judged. I read a little paragraph the other day. Hell is a place where people get what they asked for. (laughs) That's what it is. You want to live a life apart from God? Here it is. You can have it. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. 
The second death is hell. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. If anyone does not remain in me, Jesus said, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. People of God, God's judgment on you and me is redemptive. We did not read about our judgment. Okay? This is the judgment of the unbeliever. You and I will never be destroyed. Christ's judgment completes your and my salvation. And beginning next week, the new Jerusalem, the river of life, will be more pleasant to preach. Let us pray. Father, what a tremendous revelation you give when we see your judgment on the unbeliever. We get an idea of the tremendous grace that we are given the tremendous privilege we have of being brought to life, reigning with Christ Jesus. We say amen to your judgments. We praise you that we are your children. May our lives reflect that abundant grace. Bless this congregation in this week and all their needs, their sufferings, their sorrows, their grief, their joy. May we be a blessing to one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.